Electronic power assist steering, while not a new technology, is increasingly in use by the manufacturers as we prepare for an all-electric autonomous future. And when problems do occur, they may or may not require component replacement. Hi, I'm Pete Meyer. Welcome to Cardone ProTech. Cardone ProTech series is produced in partnership with MotorAge, America's oldest trade publication for the automotive professional. Have you ever driven a vehicle without power assisted steering of some kind? Likely you didn't do it intentionally. And you'll have to admit, it takes a lot of effort to get those wheels to turn. In 1951, Chrysler introduced the first hydraulic power steering system used on a production vehicle. It was called HydraGuide, and it was available on the 51 Chrysler Imperial. These systems used hydraulics to turn the wheels, multiplying the force input by the driver. The hydraulic pressure typically comes from a G-rotor or rotary vein pump driven by an accessory drive belt run off of the crankshaft. A double acting hydraulic cylinder applies a force to the steering gear, which in turn steers the wheels. The steering wheel operates valves to control the flow of fluid to the cylinder. Increasing the force applied to the steering wheel allows more fluid to flow through the valve, and this increases the amount of force applied to actually turning the wheels. The torque applied to the steering wheel is measured by a torsion bar at the lower end of the steering column. As the steering wheel rotates, so does the steering column, as well as the upper end of the torsion bar. Since the torsion bar is relatively thin and flexible, and it's mounted so the base can't turn, any amount of force used to twist the torsion bar will be proportional to the amount of torque being applied. The difference in position between the opposite ends of the torsion bar controls a valve. This valve allows fluid to flow to the cylinder, providing steering assistance. The greater the twist of the torsion bar, the greater the flow of fluid. The pump on these systems are positive displacement pumps. That means that as the engine picks up speed, so does the flow rate of the pump. A restricting orifice and flow control valve direct some of the pump's output back to the hydraulic reservoir at higher engine speeds. And a pressure relief valve is also used to prevent a dangerous buildup of pressure in the system. And while these systems have served us well for many, many years, it goes against the trend of electrification of the automobile, a process that's going to help improve overall fuel economy and minimize the environmental impact. Electronically assisted power steering or electronic power steering, whichever term you prefer to apply, helps in a number of different ways. First, it's not robbing power from the engine constantly being driven by the accessory drive belts. Second, any energy it does use is only used when needed and in proportion to that need. Environmentally, it's an improvement because there is no hydraulic fluid to deal with. There's no fluid to change, to leak, or to dispose of. And all of these factors combined also help reduce overall CO2 emissions. And because it's electric and controlled by an ECU, it's already being incorporated into a variety of ADOS, that is advanced driver assist systems, and preparation for that fully autonomous, all-electric future. Interestingly enough, its operation is not all that much different from its hydraulic predecessors. The electric power steering system uses an electric motor to provide the steering assist, and it's controlled by an electronic control unit, often referred to simply as the EPS control module. Now this module is part of the controller area network bus and receives inputs from a variety of sensors, most notably the torque angle sensor and the steering angle sensor. 
Based on these inputs, the steering control module will control the motor to provide the right amount of assist for that given condition. And if a problem should occur in the electronic side of the system, that is a faulty sensor, a problem with the power steering control module, the communication of the control module with other modules on the network, or the motor itself, usually a DTC or diagnostic trouble code will be set. In some cases, the EPS system may be disabled and that's going to require a lot more steering effort on the part of the driver. Among the most common issues reported are related to the motor. Early motors were brush type designs and prone to wear. To minimize that problem, more and more OEs are switching over to brushless motors. Overheating is another problem for both motor designs and can also lead to their failure. Commonly, overheating is caused by excessive low speed maneuvering, especially lock to lock steering conditions. We've even heard of cases reported where an incorrect steering angle sensor calibration and a high road crown could lead to overheating as well. Issues with the torque angle sensor are another common failure item reported. This sensor acts similarly to the spool valve on the hydraulic system, determining the amount of assistance provided by the electric motor. Contact type sensors are more prone to failure as the contacts wear, as opposed to contactless torque angle sensor designs. Often overlooked are faults that can either be avoided entirely or corrected without removing any of the system components. As an example, some GM HHR models had a problem with the EPS systems that were traced back to improper jump starting techniques. Failure to follow the published service procedures often resulted in blowing the 60 amp fuse supplying power to the EPS system. Another common mistake made that can result in EPS issues is failing to calibrate the torque angle or steering angle sensors after a repair or wheel alignment. And while older units may only require this zero point recalibration, many newer units require reprogramming, otherwise known as flashing, to be functional. These systems are often not plug and play, so be sure to read the service information relative to the vehicle you're repairing. Failing to do so could not only cause problems in the EPS system, but any of the ADOS systems that utilize the EPS. This is why it's so important to follow a few basic procedures anytime you're faced with an EPS concern. First, check the condition of the battery and charging system. If a low voltage condition exists, no system on the vehicle can perform as it should. Second, check for stored DTCs and then review the live data for anything that looks out of the ordinary. This is a good time to see if the sensors are correctly calibrated and working as they should. It's also a good idea to check the voltage supply PID to the power steering control module to make sure that it matches what you have at the battery and at the module. And don't forget to check the module itself for good power supply and good grounds. And always check for technical service bulletins. You'll never know if there's been a new calibration issued or the need to reprogram the control module. There could be new components released for the system that you'll need to replace. And don't underestimate your customer. If they've smacked a curb really hard or hit a really bad pothole, well that can knock the sensors out of calibration and can even damage steering components. If you do hear a strange noise and want to isolate it from the EPS components, simply remove the fuse supplying power to the system and see if the noise changes or goes away. And keep in mind that the noise you hear and suspect is coming from the EPS could be coming from another component in the suspension system. So make sure you do a good inspection of the systems before you condemn the EPS. Electronic power steering systems are evolving just as the vehicles themselves are. So the next time you get an EPS concern in your shop, take the time to do a little homework 
and check those basics first. You may just find that you can correct the problem with nothing more than a few keystrokes on your scan tool.